We're joined here with uh, Mark Molinaro, Dutchess County Executive, former member of the New York State Assembly, and I believe candidate for New York State Governor. You're right, you've got them all. That's, congratulations. Have you formally announced, or is this <laughs> something that is? I'm actually uh, uh, going to announce uh, officially on April 2nd, which happens to be International Autism Awareness Day, uh, just by coincidence, but as you know, uh, the, the topic's important to me, so uh, April 2nd will announce and kick off my campaign. That's fantastic. I mean, you, you appear like you have the full support of the GOP. I know Congressman Chris Gibson and many others um, have supported you. The recent meeting uh, in Saratoga County, yeah. you won, I believe, 55 of the 83 votes that were cast in a straw poll. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot of people in the autism community that are really excited yeah. about you running for governor. Um, did the current state of developmental disabilities weigh into your decision to run for governor? Uh, the, the fact that we don't do enough uh, for those uh, with developmental disabilities weighed uh, heavily. In fact, will be a central focus of, of my campaign. Um, be, beyond, um, uh, uh, beyond that, you know, New York State does some amazing things, but like most governments, uh, not only sometimes doesn't the left hand know what the right hand's doing, sometimes in New York the left hand doesn't know there is a right hand. So what ends up happening, of course you know, is that families and individuals are stuck uh, in this bureaucratic maze, not being able to access services that are supported. Uh, and in many ways, as a state, uh, we need to do more for everyone, uh, regardless of ability. It's been a central focus of mine as county executive, uh, and it's, it's, it is. It's one of the reasons that I, want to, that I am running for governor, because I really do want this state to be more inclusive, I want it to be more open, and I want it to be easier for those living uh, with disabilities uh, to live more independently. How, how did you become passionate um, about disability issues and to advocate for people with autism and other disabilities? I, um, you know, I, I tell folks that I, I sort of uh, fell into this, uh, this uh, you know, advocacy uh, basically by being a failed father, uh, meaning uh, in so many ways, um, you know, as a dad, um, you know, we, we're always challenged by our kids regardless. I have three amazing children, uh, two boys uh, and uh, my little girl who's going to be 14 in a few days. Uh, Abigail was born on the autism spectrum. She lives with a seizure disorder. Uh, and in so many ways, I was compensating for, for her and sort of in, 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 in not necessarily acknowledging the things that she could achieve and accomplish on her own. Uh, at the same time, holding elected office and in particular being a county executive, I knew that I'm responsible for both policy and the delivery of service. Um, and I knew in some ways we were failing. And uh, so as, as a dad trying really hard to do his best uh, for all three of his kids, uh, in particular, uh, Abigail, um, uh, uh, you know, raising a child on the autism spectrum is a, is a very special experience. It's a challenge for many families, and it's something that, uh, uh, you know, I tell everyone, if, if you have a child living with a disability, you are their best, and perhaps in many cases, their only true, genuine advocate. So um, I'm my daughter's advocate. That's great. That's great. How's she doing? Abigail is doing wonderfully mm -hmm. well. She's uh, she's in an inclusion program at uh, at our home public school system, which is great, Red Oak Central School. She's uh, she's advancing pretty well. Um, you know, socialization is always the challenge, um, mm -hmm. and, and 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 really that's uh, been you know, sort of our focus. I mean, educationally, she's making great advancements, and now we're also focused on on ensuring that she can she can live a little bit more independently and sort of get those social cues, understand uh, you know how to how to interact and relate. Uh, in certain social settings, uh, and so her emotional and social advancement has been a real focus of ours. Yeah, um, just as an observation, um, autism is more prevalent and about four to five times more prevalent <coughs> in boys than girls. Um, do you notice autism being different among girls? Well, you know, it's it's funny. It, I mean, what's the saying, right? You've met one person on the spectrum. You've met one person on the spectrum. So, right, no no two people is alike. No pe two people living on the spectrum are alike. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, what I find, and, and it is somewhat interesting, and perhaps it, it's it's also a reason that maybe some of the diagnosis doesn't always happen so, so early, is, um, you know, girls are sort of uh, encouraged um, to to mask certain social behaviors, you know, certain things are or not, you know, um, encouraged among among girls, and I don't understand that entirely. Where boys, you know, you know, they're they're always acting out, and there's always something that's sort of like going on, mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of easy to acknowledge and, and and sort of see, and for whatever reason, maybe it's a societal thing, um, I, you know, I, I do I do think that what girls attempt uh, to do uh, on the spectrum is, um, you know, sort of um, uh, how should I say, socially 
compensate for some of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So in some ways, you know, um, Abigail doesn't um, exhibit some of the same behavior that maybe you might see in a, in a, in a boy. Uh, but, uh, but again, because everybody's different, autism and the way one lives on the spectrum is, is different. Boy to girl and boy to boy and girl to girl. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you talk a bit about the Think Differently campaign? Yeah. What was the motivating factor for that? And um, uh, what that has done to complement existing state services, yeah. or was it put in place as a result of seeing certain failures within some of the state systems? Yes. Um, so, so Think Differently is a genuine call to action uh, to have businesses, communities, uh, governments, and individuals uh, really um, think carefully about how we interact with, how we accept, how we support, and how we uh, protect and, and respect uh, uh, our friends and neighbors of, of every ability. And for Dutchess County, it's a real um, you know, call to arms, if you will. Look internally. How do we make the system easier to navigate? How do we ensure that there's integration of service? How do we make sure uh, that uh, you know, we don't have silos in the delivery of service? And in the same respect, how do we change minds? You know, there's this uh, you know, this last prejudice of low expectation that, that, that society seems to sort of almost accept that certain people can't achieve certain things because of their um, interpreted ability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Think Differently is about changing those mi that mind and by extension changing the systems to, to, uh, act, to more actively and proactively provide service and assistance to make it easier for, for individuals to live more independently and really to question ourselves, why do we provide a service or a resource this way and can we do it better? Uh, so Dutchess County uh, launched Think Differently several years ago. Uh, we have uh, over 90 communities across the state of New York that have adopted our Think Differently resolutions. And it's really just an effort to think uh, comprehensively about how we, how, how we embrace uh, our neighbors of every ability and ensure that you know, at the end of the day that everyone has a family that loves them and a community that supports them. And as we as a society do more to ensure greater independence and integration uh, so that uh, everyone can, can really uh, see uh, the humanity that we share. Absolutely, and and you were able to get the support of the New York's very influential New York State Association of Counties, and uh, how did they? How did you go about making a decision to reach out to the Association of Counties yeah. and try to get them involved with? supporting uh, this initiative? Well, well, you know, New York is unique in that it requires county governments to be the deliverer of many of its services. Uh, you know, we call these unfunded mandates. But in New York, the delivery of Medicaid service and, and most of the developmental disability programs are at least the, the initial point of contact is at the county level. So it, as we looked internally to county government to change the way we do business, we launched thinkdifferently.net, which is an intuitive website to kind of help people navigate through the system to find uh, resources. Uh, it, it was clear to me that the one place we could affect substantial change without having to take on a bloated bureaucracy was to focus on the county level because at, that's really where most families make their first point of contact. Maybe it's early intervention services or special education pre-K or some interaction through your Department of Health. Mm -hmm. So for me it was, you know, look internally and, and by, by seeing how um, broadly we can impact change at the county level, it was clear that uh, uh, the association as a whole uh, could embrace this and that we counties, all of us, 62 of us across the state of New York, have the ability uh, really to affect uh, change for a, a whole population that continues to grow, continues to live uh, uh, with great challenges. So uh, when we brought it to the New York State Association of Counties, it was, it was embraced immediately, Republicans, Democrats, upstate, downstate, because we recognize that we're the ones uh, at the end of the day who are delivering that frontline access to service. And by the way, by having counties across the state and, and now towns, villages, and cities across the state, from Buffalo to Long Island, embracing the Think Differently principles, we're also pressuring the state to make adequate changes as well. And, and that really is you know, our effort to confront the bureaucracy that makes it very complicated for folks to access support. Did, did any of this um, occur due to the fact that there was a lot of uh, crisis intervention, crisis situations with people with disabilities <coughs> where the ball was more or less getting dropped? Um, by at the state level? Well, listen, um, 
we know the extreme uh, of what what happens when certain indications, so certain risks are, are missed, certain assistant is, assistance isn't offered. Uh, we see it on the news, and it, it can end in, in great tragedy uh, to the individual or to others. Uh, and we also recognize that families, um, you know, dealing and, and raising individuals, friends, family members, brothers, sisters, children um, living with disabilities, you know, are stressed. There's a lot of challenge to that, and that can erupt in, in really unfortunate scenarios. And too often government, in particular, I think, state government, um, becomes, um, you know, numb to this. And the system, uh, you know, sort of loses kids and, and individuals in, in the gaps, right? So for us, yes, it's an acknowledgement that there are too many who fall uh, between the gaps. There are too many families up too late into the night trying to navigate both the system of service and manage their own financial challenges, manage their own family challenges. I mean, this is a great deal of stress, and right, understandably so. Uh, and the one thing that shouldn't be the problem is their government. Their government shouldn't be w the one thing that adds more more stress to their lives, and we shouldn't have these situations erupt in in, in great either either you know mental health crisis or, or tragedy. So for us, it is. It's try to let's let's try to again acknowledge the humanity. Uh, understand that we need to do more to, to be welcoming and embrace uh, uh, those of every ability. Understand that the system is complicated regardless of who you are and try to break down those barriers to make it easier. Okay. Um, as we go into 2018 and World Autism Awareness Day in a, couple, uh, in a few days, um, the Centers for Disease Control Health and Human Services and the National Center for Health Statistics came out with a report in November 2017 showing that one in 36 children yeah. of school age now has autism. Um, how do we deal with the rapid increase in the demand for service requirements? And um, what would you say to those people that think that we should just continue to cut? I mean, our Office of People with Developmental Disabilities has been cut by over 31% since Governor Cuomo has been in office while state spending has gone up over 22 percent. There are a couple things that we need to do as a state and that's better coordinate the delivery of service. What we often do is say well listen uh, that particular the support for those uh, living on the spectrum that's the responsibility of OPWDD and, and we'll just put them there. But every department and division of government has a responsibility to provide every cit citizen support. So uh, it, it's a matter of ensuring that all of state government recognizes that an individual on the spectrum can 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 live independently or may need may need significant service. So that broad spectrum needs to be accommodated in all that we do, all of the agencies, and there needs to be greater integration and, and coordination. In this state, we, we outsource most of those services to local governments, which are stretched pretty thin because of uh, uh, the burden of property tax taxes on families. So the state needs to confront that. I think the state of New York should be paying for Medicaid in its entirety to ensure one integrated delivery of service, which would provide savings new resources that could be invested in service and at the same time ensure that you're not stuck as an individual having to traverse all these individual agencies to get help. But beyond that it's a matter of priority and, and, and I just would say that we are occupied by too many people in elected office who want some flashy press conference or stand in front of something that, that, that taxpayer money built instead of really getting to the heart of what we do as government. Government is supposed to help people and, and, and if there's an entire population that's being over overburdened and we're diminishing our, our commitment to them and, and, and this state has been diminishing its responsibilities to those with de <clears throat> developmental disabilities and those living with mental illness. Um, if, if that population is stressed, if that population is stretched, if that population is overburdened, we know the extreme of what happens. So for us it's a matter of making sure the government functions appropriately, help those who need it the most uh, to achieve the greatest degree of independence. And by the way, a great quality of life for an individual with a developmental disability is more valuable, more important than putting a billion dollars into some special, uh, you know, private investment someplace. Because again, we need every individual, regardless of ability, to live as independently and successfully as possible. And the state can't be focused on just those things that make headlines. We ought to be focused right. on, on ensuring that the quality of life for citizens, regardless of ability, is as high and as great as possible. But aren't, aren't lawmakers being disingenuous <clears throat> in New York State when we look at the fact that our early intervention providers have not had a raise in 25 years? Yeah. And you have children that are in need of intensive therapy 
at that time of life when it can do the most amount of good, yeah. and thousands of them are put on waiting lists. Yeah. Well, I mean, are we really, I mean, we're, how, are, how are we supposed to change the thought process on that? I mean, early intervention is just not occurring in many parts of New York State because the providers, um, by the time everything is said and done, being an independent contractor, they're making seven dollars an hour yeah. and they have they're an occupational therapist or speech therapist they're not going to work for seven dollars an hour well, so now you have these kids that are that are not getting any you know they're medically necessary services and it's just not occurring because we our our legislature has decided that that um, these kids are not a priority and uh, or or they or do they you know are they just kind of pandering to the issue but early intervention seems to be one of the areas that shows the most amount of, of measurable positive outcomes, and yet we haven't given the providers haven't had a raise. How do we how do we convince legislators? And what would you say to legislators about why we need to fund early intervention and and look really hard at the one in thirty six numbers, epidemiology, that sort of thing? Well, I guess the uh, um, uh, the somewhat uh, uh, opportunistic answer is elect a governor who understands it. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, at the end of the day, um, it is a matter of uh, uh, an executive setting priority. In this county, uh, serving those with special needs is a priority. And we make it a priority, and it integrates, uh, and it uh, permeates all that we do. Uh, that is the kind of thing that needs to happen at the state level. And, and what I would offer is, as, as you said, you know, early intervention services, whether for those living with a disability or in the area of trauma and mental, and mental health, we know we get the biggest return on the littlest or smallest investment when we make it as early as possible. We know that. Mm -hmm. And so to the point of, you know, how do we get more resources, the truth of the matter is if we were more effectively spending those resources and integrating as early as possible in the delivery of help, again, whether it's with somebody living with developmental disability or even a co-occurring mental health disorder, if we invest then, we make the greatest return on that investment, we have the greatest impact, and that's where we ought to be focusing. And I, I admit, this state has done poorly. It has, it has outsourced its, its early intervention and special education preschool. It has maintained a separate and not equal education system because of the way in which we, we, we integrate or, or sometimes don't integrate those with special needs into general ed. And then we wait for them, in essence, to be serviced by education until they're 21, and then right. there's a cliff. And you, and you fall off that cliff in services because you're not prepared, nor is the government prepared to be of help. So I would say it's not a question of, of where the legislature is, it's where the governor is. And at the end of the day, you need an executive, and again, opportunistic perhaps, but you need an executive who understands that this is a critical priority because we have so many that are being identified on the spectrum, so many that if we help early, on, uh, early enough on, we can make a measurable difference. And at the end of the day, these are citizens that, 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 that deserve our support, our, our respect, and our assistance. It seems like there is a, a, a culture and an attitude of that, that people with disabilities are not valued. You can see it in in how policy is made, and uh, you know, and you can see it from people across the political spectrum who are so upset with the governor right now on these issues, whether it's direct care. Um, do you think that your colleagues um, that that you've known in politics do they understand that autism covers the entire lifespan? I mean, first, what you're doing is important. There are so many uh, elected officials who have a family member living on the spectrum, so we get it. We understand it's a lifetime. Uh, and there are plenty of elected officials who understand uh, the impact and the need. But again, it's a question of, of, of leadership. Who is going to stand up and say that as a society we need to do better and we need to do more? I will, because I, I see it every day and I see the value. Our Think Differently initiative and the way that it's been embraced, I see the value of that and how it's impacted real lives. And so um, I, I just would offer it's, it's you know, I don't, um, this governor has not made uh, the delivery of service and the assistance to those living with disabilities a priority. That's wrong. Well, he's made massive cuts. Yeah. I mean, we have, right now, we have about 20 to 25 percent <clears throat> of kids in, in New York State of school age are IDEA disabled. I mean, this is over 400,000 school age children. And we keep making cuts. We're ma we keep freezing summer school program and overall funding to these programs and making cuts while while the rates are just skyrocketing oh, right yeah. now. And um, these kids are going to be a tremendous burden on the system, on the taxpayer. 
getting back to these 1 in 36 numbers, how do we manage the growth in New York State, and why are we not counting um, why are we not counting the numbers of kids with autism and doing the basic epidemiology that states like California have done that have, they have improved their outcomes. They've improved how they deliver services. And uh, a state like California, similar to New York in many ways, um, they have 11 million more people than we do and they spend less on Medicaid. Yeah. And seem to deliver better services. Yeah, well, this state has not taken seriously its responsibility to be efficient in the delivery of service. I mean. <laughs> It doesn't measure success. It just adds dollars to a program. And, and I think we need to be focused on success uh, and ensuring that what we're paying for is really making an impactful difference. Um, we also need to commit uh, to not only counting, but studying and understanding autism um, um, in its entirety. And we ought to be a leader in this. You know, New York State should be mm -hmm. the leader in this. So, you know, I'd like to see uh, uh, the state invest in that kind of research, uh, that kind of program development, uh, and really create a, you know, a, 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 you know, a school of excellence uh, around the concept of, 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 of studying, understanding, researching autism, uh, and also, by the way, um, maximizing um, uh, the support and assistance in a way that's the most effective so that uh, we have the best delivery system in the country, that we are the best in, in assisting those uh, living on the spectrum in the country, and that we do uh, the kind of research that uh, really would distinguish ourselves worldwide. There's no reason we shouldn't. Uh, there's no reason we can't afford it, and there's no reason we, we, we ought not be doing it now. Um, over the past few months, there have been multiple courts that have declared the Justice Center, this agency created by Governor Cuomo to investigate and prosecute crimes against um, people with disabilities in residential type of facilities. Um, they've declared that this is unconstitutional and has no real authority under New York law to prosecute. Um, multiple courts now. and. Um, why are the disabled being denied basic 911 and police protection under state policy right now? And as governor, would you change that? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, well, first of all, th there are those mm -hmm. in, in, resi in, in support of housing all over that don't sometimes have direct 911 access, and they should. Um, I mean, the short answer, of course, is, uh, you know, you know the, 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 there are policies that uh, uh, seek to um, minimize um, uh, the record of those kinds of calls, and that's, that's not something that should happen. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think statewide, uh, certainly uh, residential facilities of any kind, uh, the, the residents themselves need to have access to 911 calls. Okay. Um, how do you think high taxes and regulations are impacting New York State's ability to adequately fund autism and other developmental disabilities? Well, I mean, first of all, you, you could easily argue that New York State certainly taxes enough and has enough revenue to do better than, than what we do, and that's, that's an easy argument to make. But to the, the point that you're, you're sort of, to the question, the fact that we have such a high cost of living uh, means a few things. Uh, the burden on the business community is so great that we have seen economic stagnancy, so job opportunities are becoming fewer and further between. Uh, the cost of living is so high that those that don't have adequate income can't necessarily thrive or survive here. Uh, and because of the high burden uh, uh, and the high cost of, of living, residential costs are even, even higher. So for the developmentally disabled community, accessing housing, very complicated and difficult, limited options and high cost, accessing jobs, limited because there are so few and, and, and certainly limited options as, as it relates to quality income, uh, and then the delivery of service is so is so uh, high in New York that you know decisions are made that don't make this a priority. So whether it's transportation uh, and ensuring that there's uh, there's uh, access to and from residential to, to job opportunities, all of that is more complicated and more expensive. And the taxpayer, at the end of the day, the taxpayer is already overburdened. So I, I often say, listen, you know, if you live with somebody with a disability, you know firsthand the value of these services. But if you don't, you begin to say, well, you know, we already spend enough on on taxes. Why do I have to spend more. And it creates a very adversarial and competitive situation. It's why, by the way, the special education system isn't sufficient, because it's adversarial by nature. It says that if you need the help, you've got to come in and ask for it. You know, this governor and you have would, to fight for it sometimes. To, absolutely. And, and by the way, because of the finite <clears throat> 
um, um, because a, a property tax base is finite, right? School districts of all different sizes, you know, sometimes are, are already at their max when it, when it relates to, to, to the property tax levy. Should the state be providing that assistance so that small districts are not overburdened by the cost? I mean, I, as a state assemblyman, I, I remember families who said, you know, they were, they were almost bullied in public because the others knew that theirs was, theirs was the kid that cost 50, 75, 150 thousand dollars a year in a small district. That's heartbreaking. But, you know, the governor was very quick to go sue the federal government when he didn't like their tax policy. Well, the federal government's not off the hook here either. The, the federal government hasn't made its commitment uh, to special education since, it, since, uh, uh, since the act was, was adopted in the late 70s, early, early 80s. At the end of the day, the federal government owes all the states, but this state, billions of dollars in special education matching costs, which go, goes directly to aiding uh, school districts, taxpayers, and families needing, needing that assistance. Why aren't we making that the case? And, and by the way, Republican or Democrat, I'd make that argument. The federal government has an obligation to provide uh, assistance uh, for special education. It needs to invest in it. The state needs to do more to drive down the localized costs because of the way this adversarial system is created. And we need to invest in early intervention and special education preschool so that we get we, we provide the assistance early enough that we're making an impactful difference and we're working with the individual as they grow up and ultimately, we hope, live independently as adults. Um, as a county executive, I like the bring me back it, home expand no expand on that with um you know how do we uh, there's always seems to be a challenge of not in my budget not in my budget yeah. and we have this expanding demand for service requirements yeah. and there there always seems to be a fight and we know in the school <clears throat> systems that um when school budgets get really tight with everything, one of the first places they cut is special education. Um, we've seen this this tax cap that has been put in place that um, to a lot of people seems sensible, but what the result oftentimes is that um, the, the people where most of the cuts occur is with special education yeah. with a lot of those kids. And um, uh, you know, how do we, how do we get legislators to understand the economic impact yeah. of, of, of one in 36 and the amount of growth? We've had, for 25 years now, we've had an average of 10% growth in mm -hmm. autism in New York State with no end in sight. Yeah. Um, if you go back 25 years ago, autism used to occur for maybe 3% of the people in the developmental disability system. Now it's around 6 to 7 right. out, of, out of 10 in the developmental disability system. And so th these kids are going to be a huge... Um, you know, burden, if you will, economic, and how do we, how do we get legislators across the country who this is not their issue, but yeah. to understand that this is important. Well, I, I remember as a state assemblyman mm. uh, arguing for the expansion of insurance service for those uh, li mm. uh, living on the spectrum, and I just told my story, and I think more of us need to do that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've often hesitated to be the legislator that advocated for something because it's personal to me, right. but in this, in this, you know, in this line of work, in this uh, realm or this area of, uh, of service, we need more people to stand up regardless of their background and say, this is, this is my story and this is why it's valuable. But again, I go back to executives make those kind of priority decisions. I mean, the legislature appropriates the money. New York State doesn't have a, a, a shortage of, of money. It has, it has, it has, it has inefficient spending, and and you know I, I support the property tax cap. We don't have a revenue problem in New York. We have a spending problem in New York, and then within that spending, it's a matter of identifying efficiencies and focusing on priorities. And and again, like we've we've discussed, if you invest early enough, the lifetime cost is less. If you invest in the services uh, at the right point in time, the lifetime uh, uh, cost is less, and you make a more impactful uh, investment. And and in this state. Uh, because we have so many layers of government within the state government, it is a very wasteful and bloated bureaucracy that just needs to be confronted. And it's not a question of saying, well, we don't like the service. It's a question of, are we getting out of it what we say we're putting in? And when it comes to providing assistance to those with disabilities, the real question is, are we doing it the best we can? And no one can argue that the answer is yes. So, so then it's a question of, well, why are we doing it that way? And if the answer is, well, we've always done it that way, then it's time to change because we ultimately can, within the administration, find ways to better and more effectively invest the dollars to help real people. 
Okay, do, I mean, do you believe we're in the middle of a public health epidemic right now with autism? Well, uh, this is what I tell, I've, by the way, many people use the term epidemic. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an elected official. I leave to, 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 to medical professionals to determine what is or is not an epidemic. But I will say to you, it is without question that we are living uh, in a time where the diagnosis and, and, and uh, assignment of autism and autism spectrum disorders is growing at such a rapid rate, affecting so many people, that we are in the midst of a, a crisis crisis of kinds um, because we have to be able to uh, provide the help and support that, that uh, these individuals need and we are not able and we are not focused and we are not adequately doing so now. That is a crisis in and of itself. Okay, because there, there's, there's still people out there who regardless of the epidemiology that is proven otherwise, <coughs> um, for instance the, the study done in California showing that the rates are clearly going up. Yeah. This is not broader diagnostic criteria. Sure. And yet there's people out there saying, ah, oh, they're just they're just diagnosing better and um, they almost seem to be turning a blind eye yeah. to the the just tsunami of service requirements sure. that is that is upon us right now. Well, I, so I, I would argue to anybody that makes that argument, it's like, okay, so what's your point? Th at the end of the day, there still are this many people who are living uh, on the spectrum, who exhibit okay. and display and have uh, a, a, a spectrum disorder, who need a, need help, need assistance. So so whether you believe, one believes that it's it's purely uh, a, 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 you know, a me medical epidemic or it's greater diagnoses, it, at the end of the day, there are still more individuals who are living on the spectrum who right. are in need of help. And it's so, growing. Right. So, well, and it continues to grow. So, so my issue is, and my argument would be, we have individuals who need help. We know that the number is growing and the acknowledgement is, is broader, and therefore we have to help. <laughs> right. A study out of Drexel University, their autism program in 2017 showed that the unemployment rate yeah. among adults with autism who are seeking employment is yeah. at 86%. Yeah. Um, when we start getting into the tens of thousands of people with autism um, who age out and need adult care and services, how are we going to manage that? And, and how do we convince the legislature and other legislative bodies that we're going to have to innovate out of this type of crisis? Well, as, as, for, as it relates to employment, and it's, and it's in, as it relates to employment is the question, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, I mean, first, New York needs to change its civil service procedure to make it much easier. We, have, we, we certainly have the ability to integrate those with disabilities, in particular uh, those on the spectrum, into government jobs. But New York, as a government employer, or as an employer in itself, needs to be a leader. So changing the civil service requirements to make it easier to segment job responsibilities, to sort of uh, fit people into the right skill set as opposed mm -hmm. to saying you need to meet this job qualification. And, and that needs to be made easier. So, so I think that government at all levels, if given the latitude, uh, could be a, a much better employer. And we're at, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're no, we're no winner here in, in Dutchess County. The, 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 the civil service requirements are so complex that it's hard enough to get people uh, into, into jobs in, in government uh, of any ability. So, so government needs to be a leader in that. And then the state needs to create labor policy that allows employers to make similar similar accommodations and it's not because again a single job could be carved up into four or five responsibilities if we can if we can give an individual with a particular skill set access to income and there may mm -hmm. have to be waivers for minimum wage requirements and there ought to be consideration for uh, for salaries and structure and at the same time uh, make sure that there's transportation and housing opportunities because without those things, uh, you know, having a job without having a home or having a job without being able to get there uh, isn't of anybody's benefit. So creating those avenues uh, for employers, private sector employers, to make the appropriate accommodations I think is important. And that's, again, that's a focus of, of the state government, changing labor practices to make it easier uh, for individuals uh, to work. The other is I would say there is nothing wrong if the most integrated uh, way, uh, excuse me, the most integrated setting is some sort of work place for multiple individuals living with disabilities, that's acceptable. It shouldn't be where we put people because we don't want to provide help, but closing uh, uh, these work environments across the state is a mistake. It, it, there's an opportunity for those uh, who, who, who maybe this is the most integrated setting that they can live and work in, give them that, that job and provide that resource and that opportunity because just having that uh, is, just, it, is just so powerful to an individual and to a family. <clears throat> oh, yeah, and you know, this just goes into the whole challenge we're seeing right now across the lifespan. The parents get old, they yeah. age out, especially a, a more severely affected child. They can go into an institutional setting that can cost in excess of a million dollars per year. A group home can cost a quarter of a million dollars per year. 
And yet there are a lot of parents that believe that for maybe $100,000 a year, you could, you could keep that um, person with autism in a home environment yep. with supports. And it's significantly less money to the taxpayers, and it's, a, and it's a better quality of life. But there seems to be a lot of burdens. I mean, we're seeing placements right now for autism where there are no placements in New York State right now. And these kids are getting placed out of state in states like New Hampshire, yeah. in the great state of New York. Yeah. Um, what would you do as governor to change that, to see that we don't have a crisis of housing and, and, and these, yeah. these significant adult problems that we're seeing right now as the mean age of, of people with autism starts to reach adulthood. Again, make make both um, at-home care and then residential alternatives a priority. Uh, we, we fund and provide tax credit uh, to uh, residential development all across the state. Uh, we know that there's a crisis in housing opportunity really for, for, for so many people of, 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 of lower income, but certainly uh, those with disabilities. So make it a priority. Mm -hmm. Make the actual delivery of residential options for those with disabilities uh, a priority. Maybe it's, it's housing where both the, fa the, the parent and the child can live in, in, in a supportive setting. Maybe it's housing where we provide opportunity for the service providers to be integrated right into the residential setting. And then maybe it is some sort of uh, full care uh, residential setting. But in all of those cases, the state needs to make clear that that is a priority, and we're going to provide both the tax credit and the investment to help both the private sector make that kind of housing commitment, uh, and then the public sector support it through uh, through uh, providing resources to make it to make it open and accessible. Do you think there will be some challenges um, within your own party, within your own conference, um, and really both parties to to fund some of these social services because of the massive growth that we've seen in autism? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, when, you, when you're talking about a, a third of this population having seizures, nearly 40% being nonverbal, 44% with an intellectual disability, and an adult unemployment rate of 86%, yeah. I mean, this is going to be a huge challenge. And what's and, our alternative? And our alternative, right, right. I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, what is the alternative to not provide assistance? That's not acceptable. So, again, it's... Well, we can't go back to a Willowbrook model like we saw in New York City years ago. No, but... And there's a lot of people that right. fear that all the gains that we've made with inclusion and everything else that... We're going back to that. We're going well, well, back we're, in that direction. We're in there, well, we're creating a desert, more, more like it, where people are sort of uh, provided the opportunity to live more independently, but we're not giving them the resource to actually functionally do that. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of rhetoric with, with some assistance, but not enough change to make it effective. So what I would say is, regardless of conference or party or, or whom it is, at the end of the day, we have citizens, residents, who, who need the support. So again, it's a matter of priority. And, and I don't think New York State spends too little. I think it doesn't spend effectively. And it's a matter of getting the biggest return on the investment possible. So, so I would look to uh, it, an entire review of the way in which we provide these services and integrate and, and, and demand greater efficiency in the delivery of those services. Everything from early intervention, for prenatal, right through early intervention, right through uh, residential and housing opportunity, and integrate the public education system in, in that decision making. Again, what happens is early intervention becomes a county health department responsibility. Education from K to 12 is a public education responsibility. And then, and then the rest is, you know, in many ways, fend for yourself because you're, all, you're out there almost in a, you know, in, a, in a cliff. So you've got to get the private sector, you've got to get the public sector, you've got to get all layers of government focused on this. And I just mm -hmm. think that if we can make the change quickly enough, meaning invest early and invest effectively, um, we could perhaps, and study and research and understand what's, what is the cause and how do we, uh, how do we address uh, autism as a diagnosis. I think that we can make a measurable change and people will live more independently and the crisis will have been averted. Um, but, but we have to commit to that. There is sure. not an alternative. Do, do you and your colleagues, do, do your colleagues that you talk to about this, do they understand that autism is a whole body disorder with multiple <laughs> health issues and that some people with autism, they, they, they improve with proper medical treatment? I don't know how many um, who don't necessarily have someone close to them on the spectrum understand uh, the uh, the disorder in its entirety. I don't, and I would admit I didn't uh, know it in its entirety. Uh, there are other medical uh, conditions that come along with uh, with with ASD. There are uh, certainly other treatments that can assist. 
uh, and to help mitigate. Uh, I know in my case we've experienced um, a, a multitude of digestive uh, concerns and issues. Of course, sure. the seizure disorder, um, sleep uh, sleep related issues. So there. So I don't know that that there is enough understanding, uh, but that's also a matter of, of advocates educating a bit more and uh, elected officials listening a little bit more. Listening a little bit more. I mean, I've been literally yelled at by people for suggesting that kids with autism have seizures and gastrointestinal issues. And I mean, there's hundreds of peer-reviewed studies that, sure. that document this. And, um, and yet there still seems to be some people in the legislature who just yeah. think that is silly. We know that uh, having a digestive issue affects other aspects of our health. Right. Why wouldn't they be integrated or connected in, a, in an individual on the spectrum? Well, and, and this is the whole thing, is, is why, why have we not tried to put a policy in place that upon a diagnosis of autism that these kids get a medical workup for those common areas yeah. where we see the studies where the prevalence of, of, of gastrointestinal issues, food allergy, seizures, these kids get a, they get a, um, a diagnosis based upon observation yeah. and yet they, we know that there are, um, we know that there are these issues and I mean you take a kid who has uh, erosive esophagitis who is nonverbal. It makes medical investigations yeah. extremely challenging. And then you have that kid's not sleeping 20 hours out of a day. He goes into an educational plan. Oh, he's got behavioral problems. You know, they yeah. want to put or him on risk. Or he's exhausted. Him, right. They want to put him on Risperdal, Abilify, psychotropic drugs. This child's never had a, a, a medical workup to look yeah. at um, the medical issues that are occurring. Um, if you're elected governor, would you see do it that there? A lot there, of if you're elected governor questions. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, <laughs> would you, I mean, if you're elected governor, would you try to make a comprehensive, um, uh, in making autism a priority to see if these kids get the medical workup that they, that they need? That is, that is pretty mainstream science right now, mainstream medicine, the GI issues, yeah. the, the mitochondrial dysfunction, all this stuff that's in the, in the medical uh, literature. Um, addressing uh, autism in, in, in all of its, uh, and all of its impacts and assisting those with developmental disabilities would be a priority of mine, period. Mm -hmm. So making sure that New York is a leader uh, in both uh, the research and the delivery of service and, and the understanding of, of the broad health impacts uh, is absolutely going to be a priority. And would, we would want the stakeholders uh, in, in the medical community, in the education community and otherwise to be at the table helping us to, to truly be a worldwide leader in, in addressing, providing and assisting those on the spectrum. Um, I've identified, according to New York State data, over 65,000 people in New York State with autism. Yeah. Um, looking at various studies from Harvard, across the country on the lifetime cost of care. This is gonna cost nationally into the tens of trillions, yeah. trillions of dollars in the coming decades. Um, what would you like to see the federal government do? And do you think that they should be looking at the Combating Autism Act again and that they should be taking this serious in well, terms of um, uh, research and funding and uh, what NIH does? And that uh, sort of thing? I mean, the short answer is yes, right? The federal government needs to do more. I'd, I'd like to see the federal government make a, a commitment um, to, to not only uh, the research, uh, but as I said, I, I think that we need to make a broader commitment by the federal government to special education and, and early intervention services. I think that that's a place where uh, the federal and state governments can partner much more effectively uh, and certainly as a uh, uh, as a national concern the federal government needs to be investing more in, in research and, and, and understanding uh, in preparing for the impact of those living on the spectrum I mean do you think schools are adequately equip equipped right now to no. to address <laughs> the, the numbers of kids with everything and no, um, I mean but school districts yeah I mean in, especially in this state I mean, in the problem in New York is it's with everything it's infrastructure as much as as much as it is schools we have, a, we have an entire system that's built up around a model that doesn't necessarily work in 2018, regardless of ability. For those living with a developmental disability, the very school buildings uh, aren't equipped necessarily to, to accommodate those living on the spectrum. The classroom mm -hmm. setting isn't. The way in which we uh, we'd segment uh, our school day isn't, isn't necessarily equipped. Uh, for those living on the spectrum. So all of that needs to be identified, all of it needs to be considered, and all of it needs to be part of how we make decision making moving forward. This demand for uh, service requirements at the school level, at social services um, and, and everything else, um, that there are, there are not enough 
choices for people who have different forms of autism, so yeah. if you will, on the spectrum. Well, you know, it, it, the, the issue, I think, is despite the well-meaning and the well-intentioned players in the, in the field, I mean, there's no question. I mean, my, my daughter has wonderful teachers. But the structure is is such that it's complicated to be able to provide the assistance that each or the service that each of these individual uh, students needs, which again becomes a question of priority at the state and federal level. How do we change the structure to make uh, educational opportunities, early inter inter intervention services, and then everything else during the lifetime of an individual living on the spectrum? How do we make that more integrated, more effective, and more accessible? And if we're asking those questions as a priority, I'm pretty confident we can find the solution because there are plenty of people who have great ideas that we just need to sort of strip away the bureaucracy and the protocol and figure out a way to more efficiently and effect effectively help those living on the spectrum. Okay. Um, how important is it for parents and self-advocates to make legislative advocacy a priority? It's, I mean, it's just well known that many people are just they're intimidated by it. Yeah. I mean, you're a nice guy. I'm not intimidated by you. You know, come I can on, be very come on. You know, I know, but but seriously, I've talked to a lot of parents, and they're just like they. They, they'll talk tough on social media, but at the end of the day, they will not go in and meet with their elected officials. Well, I mean, there's a how, how, yeah. Can you just, if you were talking to a group of parents that were trying to advance autism policy, what would you say to them about the importance yeah. of, of learning this new simple skill set of legislative advocacy, going in, meeting with legislators and staffs? And, yeah, uh, I mean, first, every advancement in policy for those living with disabilities has come because a parent of a child has been the advocate. And no one is going to advocate for your child better than you are. And I understand uh, the, the, the steep slope. I understand the, uh, the intimidating factor of having to do that. And it's unfortunate that we have to. Um, but in order to get people who don't understand or have a thousand priorities to focus in on the real need here, we have to be those advocates. Because if we're not, you cannot be confident that someone else is going to be. And, and nobody can explain your story, your challenge, your, your blessing better than you can. Do you talk to your colleagues and are they aware of the concern that a lot of people have about the possible role of environmental toxins in the uh, autism epidemic? Um, you know, I, I have personally um, not gotten into the debate as to what, what is the cause, right? Because I frankly have a beautiful child who is perfect in every way and I leave to other people to make uh, the arguments about that. I mean, mm -hmm. just that's been my, because I, again, just as we just discussed, you can only advocate for so many things, right? Right. I, yeah. um, but I, there there, there, there is a, you know, there's a dialogue about what is, you know, what is driving up uh, the the number of diagnoses. Why, why, why do we have so many who are being uh, who are being diagnosed on the autism spectrum? And a conversation about environmental, social, and other impacts that go into uh, genetic uh, impacts that, that go into that that diagnoses. But again, I think if the state of New York were advancing beyond where California is or others in sort of the research, mm -hmm. um, we would have a much broader and, and I think a wealthier um, uh, understanding uh, of, uh, of what's the cause and how do we help to, uh, to perhaps prevent. But again, I understand from my perspective, my daughter is perfect. Right. And so I don't necessarily sure. come to the table thinking, well, some, something, something went wrong that produced it. No, everything went right to produce my daughter the way that she is. Sure. So I, I'll, I'll leave to the scientists and the doctors to have that conversation. Right, okay. Um, why, why do you think hundreds of thousands of parents across the country that are doctors, lawyers, architects, engineers, prime business people, why do you think that they have claimed that vaccines have contributed to their child developing autism? Uh, I, you know, listen, I, we, we know that certain um, um, uh, autistic attributes uh, begin to materialize and be seen outwardly around the time that kids get certain vaccines. So I think the, the assumption that many just make is that they're connected. Certainly there has been a, a you know, if not social media, at least, um, you know, individuals of some prominence who make the argument that they're, they're linked. Um, and there's always skepticism anytime, um, uh, you know, medicine is, is brought into the, into the mix. Mm -hmm. And I, 
and I sort of I get that I understand it but if no one's doing the real research if no one's leading the effort and meaning to truly not only debunk but also address what what ultimately are the factors that cause uh, uh, a an autist an autism diagnosis you know the void gets filled with a lot of other chatter and a lot of other conversation the other though is that there are a lot of people who are just busy in their lives and they and they just assume certain information is accurate or certain things that they heard is accurate or just focused on something else like I mean you could say I'm at fault because I, I my my concern is what do I do to provide assistance to those on the spectrum not necessarily what do we do to prevent the the diagnoses to begin with yeah um, is there anything that we haven't covered about autism and related public policy challenges and services and research that um, that you'd like to discuss that we haven't covered I don't think here? so but let me I, I want I do want to say this um, you know, they. It's often been said that um, um, you know it takes special people to raise an individual with a special need. The truth is, it's the other way around. Um, I, I want people to understand in in the big debate about what causes, how do we prevent, and how do we help uh, those living on the spectrum. We need to think differently and understand that 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 at the end of the day, we need to invest in those things. Um, but these individuals are so special that that um, they. You know, they they remind us in many ways of our own humanity, and it would be nice if, as a society, we kind of toned it down, focused on 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 providing the help that that to these individuals need, but also see the very special, very authentic, very genuine humanity that exists. the The small successes that we experience um, are so major, so important, so valuable. It reminds us that we're all in this together. That there that we all share the same earth. We all breathe the same air. We all have the same hopes and dreams for our kids and our families. And I do think in many ways uh, those with the developmental disability remind us of that very special uh, commonality that we have. And if it would be nice if that is what we consumed our time with. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. You're, you're welcome. Thank you.